وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا فهم لنا إلا ما فهمتنا إنك أنت الجواد الكريم We are going to um, show inshallah our method in Ruqya So this method starts by explaining the symptoms How do we know that someone has a jinn or sihr or ayn nazar problem So there are four symptoms that show that The first symptom is blockages in life That means think though things don't work, you can't get a job, your money gets wasted, you can't get married, you can't have children, you can't study, you can't pass your examinations, whatever you try to do is getting blocked, unusual and repeated blockages, until yourself you understand that there is something not normal going in your life, there is an invisible force that is stopping your life from going forward, and that is what is sihr, what is sorcery, black magic about. It is an invisible force who is attacking your life. As Allah Taala says, وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ We ask Allah to protect us from the evil of those who blow on the knots. So they attach knots and they say satanic things and that is the sihr that is going to attach your life. So it can attach a man's life so it will not work. It can attach a woman's womb so she will not have any children. It can attach a student's mind so we not understand anything at school. The second symptom is unusual health problems. For example, if you eat sihr, it is going to give you pain in your stomach. The sihr is drops like water they put in the food or drink, and when you drink it or eat it, it will stick in your stomach or intestines like glue, and your body will feel that there is uh, there's a foreign something strange there it's going to attack it the acids digestive acids will attack it and you'll feel burning in your stomach like if you're scraping your skin because it is itching you and you continue scraping until it becomes red and then it becomes bleeding and this is how you can get an ulcer because of sihr without any physical or medical reason to have it and this these digestive problems will last for years and years and You can avoid some kinds of food or take some medicine to have some kind of relief but the problem will always be there and not explainable, not understandable by medicine. For example, if you walk on the sihr, it will give you problem in your legs and your skin, some kind of eczema that is called psoriasis and that medicine has absolutely no explanation of why it comes and then it spreads and it lasts and there is absolutely no treatment for it and sometimes it disappears so doctors can only see it happening and not, not being able to understand or to act on it also sihr black magic makes various pains like having headaches, backaches, leg aches, uh, chest pains or chest being pressurized it also gives pains and problems in menses and sterility Uh, and the potence for men and it can also make some difficult diseases some severe illnesses can be also due to sorcery Allah Taala mentions these health problems due to magic and genes in Quran saying like the one the devil shakes in position so also epilepsy can be due to jinn and sihr The third symptom is unusual mental states. That means getting angry too much, especially in a couple. So you can recognize problems in a couple that are due to sihr because their fighting is not based on anything. There's no real reason for fighting. They get to argue for very stupid things, and for meanless things. And the more they discuss about it, the more it gets worse and worse and worse. And when they separate, they cool down and each one will regret and say why did I do this, why did I say this and the love, they will feel love again and as soon as they come back together so the problem will come again because that sihr is to separate them so when they are separated it stops working 
and when they come back together the sehr starts working again and also uh, sehr makes depression sadness and how you know that this is not a normal sadness a normal depression is that sadness depression comes by problems in life by having failures in one's life by going through difficult hardship so that will affect the person and he can lose confidence in himself he can lose pleasure in life he can lose hope because he has gone through very difficult conditions but someone who's got everything he was fine and suddenly he stops his activities and he starts closing uh, himself in his room and not wanting to do anything without any visible reason so this is not normal and that is due to sorcery and jinns and also having fears uh, and having doubt not being able to concentrate and to learn things and hallucinations hearing th hearing voices seeing things and it can go all the way to madness so in these unusual mental states Allah Taala says فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They learn from them how to separate a man from his wife. So this is the sihr that separates a couple and changes the mental states and the feelings of the people. And the last of the four symptoms is nightmares, bad dreams. So naturally the sihr and jinns come in the dreams. Allah Taala mentions that in Quran in Surah Al-Anfal where Allah Ta'ala says الشيطان, it is to remove from you the impurity of shaitan Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana inna kanta al-alimu al-hakim wa la fahma lana illa ma fahamtana inna kanta al-jawad al-kareem We are going to um, show insha'Allah our method in Ruqya so this method starts by explaining the symptoms how do we know that someone has a jinn or sihr or ayn nazar problem so there are four symptoms that show that the first symptom is blockages in life that means think though things don't work you can't get a job your money gets wasted you can't get married you can't have children you can't study you can't pass your examinations whatever you try to do is getting blocked unusual and repeated blockages until yourself you understand that there is something not normal going in your life there is an invisible force that is stopping your life from going forward and that is what is sihr, what is sorcery, black magic about it is an invisible force who is attacking your life as Allah Taala says وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ we ask Allah to protect us from the evil of those who blow on the knots so they attach knots and they say satanic things and that is the sihr that is going to attach your life so it can attach a man's life so it will not work it can attach a woman's womb so she will not have any children it can attach a student's mind so he will not understand anything at school the second symptom is unusual health problems for example if you eat sihr it is going to give you pain in your stomach the sihr is drops like water they put in the food or drink and when you drink it or eat it it will stick in your stomach or intestines like glue and your body will feel that there is uh, there's a foreign something strange there it's going to attack it the acids digestive acids will attack it and you will feel burning in your stomach like if you're scraping your skin because it is itching you and you continue scraping until it becomes red and then it becomes bleeding and this is how you can get an ulcer because of sihr without any physical or medical reason to have it and this, these digestive problems will last for years and years and you can avoid some kinds of food or take some medicine to have some kind of relief but the problem will always be there and not explainable not understandable by medicine for example, if you walk on the sihr, it will give you problem in your legs and your skin, some kind of eczema that is called psoriasis, and that medicine has absolutely no explanation of why it comes, and then it spreads, and it lasts, and there is absolutely no treatment for it, and sometimes it disappears. So doctors can only see it happening, and not, not being able to understand or to act on it. 
Also, Seher Black Magic makes various pains like having headaches, backaches, leg aches, uh, chest pains or chest being pressurized. It also gives pains and problems in menses and sterility uh, and importance for men. And it can also make some difficult diseases, some severe illnesses can be also due to sorcery. Allah Taala mentions these health problems due to magic and jinns in Quran saying like the one the devil shakes in position. So also epilepsy can be due to jinn and sihr. The third symptom is unusual mental states. That means getting angry too much, especially in a couple. So you can recognize problems in a couple that are due to sihr because they're fighting is not based on anything there's no real reason for fighting they get to argue for very stupid things and for meanly meanless things and the more they discuss about it the more it gets worse and worse and worse and when they separate they cool down and each one will regret and say why did I do this why did I say this and the love they will feel love again and as soon as they come back together so the problem will come again because that sihr is to separate them so when they are separated it stops working and when they come back together the sihr starts working again and also uh, sihr makes depression, sadness and how you know that this is not a normal sadness, a normal depression is that sadness, depression comes by problems in life by having failures in one's life by going through difficult hardship so that will affect the person and he can lose confidence in himself he can lose pleasure in life he can lose hope because he has gone through very difficult conditions but someone who's got everything he was fine and suddenly he stops his activities and he starts closing uh, himself in his room and not wanting to do anything without any visible reason so this is not normal and that is due to sorcery and jinns and also having fears uh, and having doubt not being able to concentrate and to learn things and hallucinations hearing th hearing voices seeing things and it can go all the way to madness so in these unusual mental states Allah Taala says they learn from them how to separate a man from his wife. So this is the sihr that separates a couple and changes the mental states and the feelings of the people. And the last of the four symptoms is nightmares, bad dreams. So naturally the sihr and jinns come in the dreams. Allah mentions that in Quran in Surah Al-Anfal where Allah Ta'ala says وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِيزَ الشَّيْطَانِ it is to remove from you the impurity of shaitan and this concerns the battle of Badr the night of Badr many Sahaba had wet dreams and were on Janaba in the morning and Allah Ta'ala said that that is shaitan he wanted, he made you those dreams so that you will be on Janaba for the battle and Allah Ta'ala sent rain to purify you from that bad effect of shaitan so this is how sexual dreams are part of the effects of sorcery and jinns. So concerning the nightmares, so there is a very close relation between sorcery and nightmares. That means the way they do, the way they work on you by sorcery will appear in your dreams. For example, if they put the sorcery in a graveyard, and that can be done by many different ways, they can just go to a graveyard and, and uh, bury the sorcery in the sand they can find a grave that is already uh, dug and they will uh, they will uh, uh, bury the sorcery inside after one day or two they will a man a person will be buried in that grave they can also take the sand from the graveyard and use it to work to make the sorcery they can take the water for washing the uh, the maid the dead person and use it or, or cut a piece of his kafan to make the sorcery, they can also put it inside the kafan. They also sometimes dig out dead people and use their bodies uh, to make the sorcery. Anyway, it all comes back, it calls, comes to one thing, to the sorcery made in cemetery. So that will have an effect on the person, on the person to whom 
the witchcraft has been made that he will become like dead that means he'll be always tired even if he sleeps in the night he wakes up tired and uh, he's also depressed and not having any happiness and any desire in life any and just living f uh, from day to day and not having any look into the future and he would be dreaming about dead people either dead people he sees them alive or live people he sees them dead he sees them dead or he can see himself dead or he can see graves or he can see funerals so by any means he would see things related to death in his dreams when they put the sorcery on a high place like a tree or a mountain so that will have uh, an effect of surrounding the person so that he will go round and round in his life instead of going forward and achieving things in his life and the second effect will be to lift his mind over reality so he will be imagining things like being afraid of things or being doubting about things that way he will be living in a imagination and not having a practical and pragmatic thinking and he will see in his dreams heights either he sees himself climbing or flying or falling or going down or slipping by any means he would see, or in an airplane but so by any means he will see himself in heights in the dreams when the sihr is put in water like river or sea so that is made to lose someone's life as if his life is going like water so without any benefit so this is how his years and his life goes by or as if he's trying to build something in the water so whatever you try to build the water is taking it away and his money will go like water it's like if you take money in your hand water in your hands so by the time you raise your hands it's all gone so this is how his money will go and he would see water in his dream so he can see rivers he can see himself crossing water he can see himself swimming or being drowned or living under the water or rain falling on him so by any different way he would see water in his dreams when the sihr is done with a lock that is to lock someone's life to stop something happening in his life so he will see in his dream he will see himself being chased uh, like this lock attaching him he will see people behind him chasing him sometimes he will run sometimes he cannot run sometimes he keeps on running and running and he will wake up so tired and he will never be caught up by those people and he will it will end up either him waking up or flying away or falling down or falling in water and if he faces them he will be fighting and fighting and fighting with them so these be, being chased and fighting in, in dreams shows that the sorcery has been made with a lock <clears throat> when the sorcery is made by knots and that is to attach someone's life either his job either his marriage either having children either his thinking either relations between people so he will see snakes in his dreams like the sorcerers of Pharaoh that turned the, the ropes and the sticks into snakes and when the sihr is done with the footsteps of the person that means the dust he has passed on they take the dust they make sihr with that so you will see in your dreams your, yourself you will see vehicles cars or airplanes or boats or any kinds of vehicles or you see yourself in a journey you can see yourself having accidents in the car or the car not having any brakes so by any means you're going to see uh, uh, travel means uh, or yourself traveling when the sihr is done with underwear underwear is used to make sihr and this is mostly for women so they will see children or babies in their dreams as children and babies are related to breastfeeding and when the sihr is done with something related to sex like the pants or pubis hair or the sendagin to put the sihr in the sex of the person so that will have sexual effects on the life of the person and he will have excessive sexual dreams and when the sihr is done with the menses blood of the woman so that will mostly affect her that she cannot stand her husband she will not like her husband anymore that will change her feelings towards her husband that can also be used to stop her getting pregnant so every month when she has a delay in her periods she thinks maybe she's pregnant so she, she will see the blood in her dreams and in the morning she will get her periods so it can also be used 
to stop a woman getting pregnant and she will see blood in her dreams. And when seher is made in toilets or is done by waste, by human waste, so that is done so that the person becomes disgusting and he will see toilet in his dreams or human waste in his dreams. It can come in different shapes but that's how it comes in the dreams. So this is how the fourth a symptom is the bad dreams is very much related to sihr and jinns. So this diagnostic with these four symptoms has many advantages. The first advantage is that it is logical and rational diagnostic. Anyone can understand it, anyone can analyze his own situation and understand what is happening to him. Second point, there is no need for jinns, angels or ghaybi process, does not need any process that, uh, that one cannot understand, that is hidden, that is secret, that is strange and that can be not Islamic, uh, that can be not clear. So no need for any, no need for jinns, for example we don't need to read on the patient and expect, expect a jinn to speak by his mouth and ask that jinn what is the problem of this patient and because most patients the jinns will never speak to them and even if the, when the jinn speak it will not be easy to get a good information from that jinn so we don't need jinns we don't need any other process to understand what the person has just discussing with him understanding and analyzing his symptoms to understand the problem he has and the four, third advantage that these four symptoms are mentioned in Quran, as I, as I, I have told you, the verses of these four symptoms. And another advantage is that the four symptoms draw the boundaries between what is normal and the unseen and the ghaib world. So the, the common point in these four symptoms is that it is the line that makes the difference between what is normal and what is not normal, what is paranormal, uh, what is ghaybi, what is sihr and jinn and ayn. So for example blockages, anyone can have a problem, can have an accident, can, can lose his job, etc. But when these problems are unusual and repeated until yourself you understand that this is not normal, there is something blocking your life. You cannot say every time Oh, it just happened or this is bad like no there is something that is stopping you going forward and an invisible force blocking your life that is sorcery that is black magic and also the unusual health problems that doctors don't understand medicine does not understand whereas in our days medicine is so much developed that we cannot we can hardly imagine any tiny thing that medicine will not understand and the third is mental cases, mental problems that are not usual, not explainable by usual life problems. And these also bad dreams, so also bad dreams that you know yourself that you did not imagine that dream, it's not yourself that is imagining that. So these four symptoms draw the boundaries between what is normal and not normal, so now you know that you, you have something unusual going into your life and needs a treatment of Rukhya. And the fifth advantage is that there's no need to distinguish between Jinn and Sihir, black magic, and Ain, Nazar, uh, evil eye. There's no need to distinguish between the three because the treatment will be the same. For example, if you have headache, we're going to make cupping on your head or on your neck to remove that headache with the Rukhya. Uh, and if, if that headache is due to jinn or sihr or nazar, ayn, there's no difference. We'll still, the treatment is the same. Now, what is the treatment? The basic treatment. The basic treatment, you're going to take some water, enough water to wash for 12 days and drink, let's say, a gallon of 25 liters or 18 bottles of a liter and a half. And you will read on them, Fatiha, Ayatul Kursi, Qul Hu Allah Ahad Al Falaq Al Nas, and three special verses to remove the sihr. It is the verses of Musa alayhi salam, 
with the Sahir of Fir'aun where Allah Ta'ala says that Allah destroys the Sahir by his words. In Surah A'raf, Surah 7, verses 117 to 122. And then Surah Yunus, Surah 10, verses 81 and 82. And Surah Taha, Surah 20, verses 68 to 70. So all these verses, you read them all 11 times on that water. Once you have read that on the water, that water, inshallah, will remove the jinn, the sihr, and the evil eye. So what are you going to do with that water? You drink from it, and you're going to bathe every night with a 1.5 liter bottle of that water. So you can warm it up, you can take a shower before if you want, and you're going to empty that water on your body. Huh? And you must collect the water in a basin to throw it in the nature or in a clean place so it does not go uh, in the uh, it does not go in the waste. And also you're going to spray your house uh, with that water. So you keep on washing that way for 12 days. And you spray you, all of your house with that water. So you put it in a sprayer or you can do it with your hand. And you spray all the surface, the walls, the roof, the ground, the doors, the windows. If you have a shop or workplace or vehicles that have problems, you can spray them all with that water, inshallah it will go. So what you must understand in this method, first is that reading Quran on water to drink and wash and to spray your house is much more efficient than simply reading in your house. The difference between both is it is like if you are hot and you want to cool yourself down and you use a fan and now you cool yourself down with a shower so a shower will be much more efficient than a fan to cool yourself down and this is how reading the Quran on water and drinking and washing and spraying your house will be much more efficient than only reading in your house so the protections you get in hadiths are based on reading and maybe wiping your body with your hands so that is protections, but once you are hurt, once you are hurt, the protections are not enough and you need treatment. And this is how, this is why you must move on to this washing and water procedure. And also these verses I have given you are the fundamental verses of Ruqya. So you can add much more verses that are in Hadith or that are in the Ruqya books or whatever the verses you want or Dua of of uh, healing the, of Rasulullah and you can add more than 11 times anyway the more you read on the water the more it will be efficient so even if you have a big problem you will read more and more and more until it will be enough to solve your problem and even if someone cannot read all these verses so whatever you can read you're going to read it more and more and more on the water until it will be enough to solve your problems inshallah and when you read on the water, in the same time you can read on oil, olive oil, or habasada oil, or any oil that is convenient to rub on your body, to massage with. And after you wash with the water, you rub your body with that oil. So all the time the oil will be on your body, the Qur'an is continuing, the Qur'an will continue working on you. So it is best to do that before sleeping, so the Qur'an will work on your body all night long and you should insist on the places where you have pains or skin problems. Now we're going to go into more details of the treatment. So the treatment of these three things, jinn and sihr and evil eye, all comes back, all comes down to treating the sorcery. Why? Because the jinns most of the time come by sorcery. Even if they did not come by sorcery, they can come by revenge, they can come by love, they can come just to find a place to stay in. Mostly, there is some sorcery that had allowed them to come in, and that is protecting them, and that is feeding them. So, mostly the problem of jinn is related to sorcery, and if you try to remove the jinn without removing the sorcery, it will be tiring for the healer, and for the patient, and also for the jinn, with very little result. Whereas, if you start by removing the sorcery, so the jinn himself will not have any reason to stay and he's quite likely to go. And also, the same treatment to remove the sihr will attack that jinn that is related to the sihr. So it is better and more logical to start by removing the sihr. And the evil eye, the ayn, the nazar, is the weakest of all three, uh, all three problems. 
and uh, the treatment for evil eye is always included inside the general treatment. Now, how to remove the sihr? It depends on how the sihr has been done and not on the purpose for which the sihr has been done. For example, if someone has eaten the sihr, would it be to stop him working or to stop him getting married or to get him ill or whatever? The treatment is the same. That sihr has to go out of his stomach. So this is how that the treatment depends on how the sihr has been done and not on what purpose it was done for. So there are four ways of doing the sihr. The first one is the eaten sihr. So that we're going to treat with sana. Sana makki or sana haram are leaves that Rasulullah recommended that look like henna and are give diarrhea. Uh, they empty one's stomach. So when we drink them with Quranic water, that will remove the sihr from the stomach. You can buy them in, uh, if you go uh, to Mecca and Medina in Arab countries, also in India. Uh, and you can get it in Chinese herbal shops. You can also sometimes get it in uh, homeopathic chemistries. So you're going to boil one big tablespoon of sana leaves with half a liter of Quranic water for five or ten minutes and then you let it cool down a bit and you drink it on empty stomach in the morning. After that you should wait 20 minutes before eating. That will inshallah empty totally your stomach and, and remove the sihr. So it's good to grab it off as if you have glue on your skin and you are scraping it off. So if you have sihr Inshallah, the sana will remove it and it's going to give you pain. So if that does give you pain, you understand that you have eaten sihr, you're going to repeat this operation every day until you get no more pains. So the day it will give you diarrhea without pains, you know, understand that the sihr is finished in your stomach. So this is a very simple and very efficient way of treating oneself and everybody can do that and we really hope that a maximum of people will apply this method on themselves. So the second kind of sihr is the sihr that is put in the body. That means they send a jinn and the jinn will put that sihr in the body uh, to make some problem in the body. For example, to stop a woman having children, they will put the sihr in her ovaries to stop a student uh, understanding or working at school, they'll put the sihr in his mind to stop someone working, they'll put the sihr in his arm or whatever he needs to work on his body. It can just be put in the body to fix a jinn inside the body so the jinn will be attached to that sorcery and as long as it is not removed it will not be possible to remove the jinn. Um, so we remove that sihr with cupping, with hijama. So we put the hijama in all places where there are pains or dysfunctioning in the body and when we put the cupping we cover the patient and then we read the ruqya on the patient and after reading the ruqya we will remove the cups and this is how the cups will remove the sihr of the patient. It also has very strong effect on the jinns because the jinns are in the blood and taking out a bit of the blood will tear the body of the jinn. So even if you are not sure that it is sihr or jinn in that place, we just make the cupping because Rasulullah said that the cupping is a shifa, a remedy for 40 diseases. So there are many illnesses that modern medicine cannot uh, deal with and that can be removed with cupping. And the third kind of sihr is the sihr that is stamped on, stepped on or touched. So it can be touched in any way, it can be put in someone's clothes or something that you cream or whatever you put on your body. But most of the time this contact comes by walking on the sihr. And this walking can be accidentally and it can be on purpose when they put it in front of someone's house or someone's business and you'll be going over it every time you go in and out. Um, so that causes leg pains and also skin diseases, uh, psoriasis, and we treat that with cupping and washing with water and rubbing one's body with oil. And the fourth 
kind of seher is the symbolic seher or made by distance. So th that means they take something of the person like his photo, his hair, his clothes or anything that they can get that has been touched by him and they will work sorcery with that uh, like making knots or making locks or putting it in a cemetery, in a well, in water, in different places. So how to remove that sihr? We will use verses of Quran for each type of sihr. For example, if the sihr is made in a graveyard and we know that because the person will be feeling like dead and seeing dead people in his dreams. So if the sihr is in the graveyard, we'll take this verse is the person who was dead and we brought him back to life and we gave him a light by which he walks amongst people is he equal to the one who is in darkness not coming out of it <coughs> it is in surat an the verse 123 so we will read that verse add that verse in the water the patient is going to wash with either by reading it or by writing it and diluting it and the person will wash with that water and the sihr will, will go insha'Allah <coughs> so it is very simple and very <coughs> clear method based on Quran and based on logical understanding of the symptoms of the person so we have 45 verses for 45 different kinds of sihr that and the ways of understanding them and detecting them for example I was in Ivory Coast and <clears throat> many many patients were seeing fish in their dreams and some see fresh fish some see dead rotten fish some see cooked fish some see uh, dried fish and we were wondering what kind of thing is this how come all these patients see the same dreams about fish it means that there is some kind of sihr that is using fish or related to fish so we made some inquiry and we found out that the sorcerers magicians have a way a method of making sihr they put it on a hook and they put the hook in water and they wait for a fish to come eat that sihr and then they release the fish in the water and the fish will go with your sihr so how can you ever find it again and the people see the fish in their dreams according to what happened to your own fish so you're seeing fresh fish or dead fish or cooked fish or dried fish or whatever kind of fish depending on what happened to your own fish and some patients also see sharks that means that your fish <coughs> has been eaten by sharks so now you have to look for a shark so so we found this verse the fish ate him the fish swallowed him when he was wrong and if it was not the tasbih he was doing he would have stayed in his stomach until the, 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 the day of that judgment so so we add this verse in the water of the patient and the patient will wash with it and the sihr will go alhamdulillah there's no need to look for the fish there's no need to go to graveyards to dig out and to look for your sihr to go into different places you just add these verses in the water and you wash with it and it all goes we are going to show you the most common verses for the most the verses for the most common symbols so for the sorcery related to death I told you and for the sorcery in the tree also in Surah Al-An'am وَعِنْدَهُمَا فَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُوْ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا for the, uh, for the sorcerer in the water uh, you have the verse فَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَى نَضْرِ بِعَصَاكَ الْبَحْرَ فَانْفَلَقَ فَكَانَ كُلُّ فِرْقٍ كَالتَّوْدِ الْعَظِيمِ for the lock أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتْ رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حِينَ فَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ for the knots وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي for the footsteps أُرْكُضْ بِرِجْلِكَ هَذَا مُخْتَسَلٌ بَارِدٌ وَشَرَبْ for the sexual sorcery بَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا وَطَفِقَا يَخْصِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ and for the, for the sorcerer in the toilet, 
so وربك فكبر وثيابك فتهير فتهير والرجس فهجر. I must tell you, I read Quran on riwaya riwaya of Qalun and not half. So sometimes you'll see some differences. So don't be worried about it. So we have the possibility if the symptoms are very strong to read those verses verses more and more and more in the water of the person. For example, if the effect of death. Is very strong, and the person is lying down all the time, not wanting to live or wanting to commit suicide or dreaming very, very much about dead people. So we take that verse, an Am one, one, two, three, and read it more in his water, like thirty times, one hundred times, and when so that will increase the effect of the treatment and and uh, help him heal heal uh, faster, inshallah. So the result of all this is that you can understand your problems on your own and you can treat yourself. By the grace of Allah Taala, this makes it all clear. This makes it all clear what is happening in your life, what has been done to you, how can you treat yourself, how can you do that. It is all clear, inshallah, from A to Z. And this whole treatment is based on Quran and using the Hadith. A specific hadith of Prophet ﷺ where he says Allah has created illness and remedy and Allah has made for each illness a remedy. When the remedy is put on the illness, the person will heal, uh, will cure by Allah's will. So the remedy is Quran and all these tools that are water, oil, sana leaves, cupping, uh, all that is to make to put the Quran on the on the sorcery or on the jinn or on the ayn uh, so that the person will be cured. Now we're going to talk about another topic, the topic of jinns. And I'm going to explain to you inshallah five ways to overcome the jinns, to beat the jinns. Allah Ta'ala has preferred men on jinns because Allah Ta'ala says in Nijailun fil Ardi Khalifa, I am putting a Khalifa someone to represent me, to, to, um, uh, to someone who's going to take care of earth on my behalf. And Allah said that to angels when the jinns were already on earth. So it's not the jinns that are the caliph of Allah Ta'ala, it is the humans. And when Allah created Adam السلام, Allah asked Iblis to bow to Adam to make sujood to Adam السلام, and the bliss was the best of all jinns at that time. So Allah showed him that now this is going to be your master and he is going to command on earth and you will have to obey him. And Iblis refused and ha had takabbur, uh, had pride and refused and he rebelled to Allah Taala. But this is the position that Allah Taala has given to man compared to jinn. And also all the prophets Allah Taala has sent are only humans. There, are nev there never was a jinn prophet. So the humans were prophets for men and jinns. And the result of this value Allah has given to man is that we, sh we human beings should not worship any jinns and should not be afraid of jinns, should not think that jinns are a great thing, that if I have a jinn that is working with me or helping me, that I will become very powerful, very rich, I will have great success in life. We must not believe uh, the pa any power, capacities in jinns. Uh, we, must not, uh, we must not bow to their conditions if they ask some things, some different things for us. And we're going to explain to you, inshallah, that however a jinn attacks a human being, you can always beat him, you can even kill him. Most of the time the jinns attack us in our dreams. So you sleep, you see something attacking you like snakes or dogs or cows, bulls or uh, humans or militaries or somebody abusing of, uh, of a lady or a monster, any kind of thing attacking you. If you remember in your dreams to say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, to read Quran, that will stop him and he's going to run away. So what should you do? You should catch him first and then read Ayat al-Kursi until he's dead. So if he dies in the dream, he'll really die. It's going to be finished. That is the end of him. 
So how can you remember in your dream to catch him and then to read Ayat al-Kursi? You must prepare yourself before sleeping. So before sleeping, you read your adhkar, you read three qul in your hands, wipe your body three times, read Ayat al-Kursi, other, any adhkar you do, and then you add this verse, أَيْنَ مَا تَكُونُوا يَأْتِبِكُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ It is Baqarah 148. And you ask Allah Ta'ala to bring you this jinn in your dream and give you the power to beat him. And you go to sleep with the anger to catch him. As soon as you see him in your dream, you start, you catch him and you read, 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 Ayat al-Kursi, uh, until he's dead. And you repeat that every night until you finish them all. Even if it is someone else having a problem with jinn, like your son screaming by night, or your wife seeing jinn, seeing people having sex with her, or your mother hearing voices confusing her mind, so you can yourself make the dua before sleeping and ask Allah to bring his jinn in your dream and give you the power to kill him, and you will kill him and the person will be relieved. Even if you see the person making sihr in your dreams, if you kill him or beat him in your dream, that will break his sihr and turn back, back against him. And we have had many, many cases with our patients, how the sorcerers died that way, or something very dangerous happened to them and they stopped, and some will repent to Allah Taala. So you must know that you cannot forgive to a sorcerer, to a magician, because Allah Taala la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah does not forgive that someone associates associates to him and sorcery is kufr so there is no forgiveness for them so what is better for them is that Allah punishes them right now in this world and maybe this punishment will be a cause for them to make repentance and the second way jinns attack people is people being crushed in their sleep so you're sleeping you're about to sleep you feel something coming on you making pressure on you crushing you paralyzing you so you cannot move, you cannot speak, and maybe even you cannot breathe. So that is jinns attacking people. If you feel that, what should you do? You First of all, you should catch him. How can you catch him when you are paralyzed yourself? Just catch your hands. Try to hold your hands as you can. Once you just have tried to hold your hands a bit, start reading in your mind. So start reading in your mind, Ayat al-Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al qayyum As your tongue is attached, leave your tongue and read in your mind until your tongue is released and then you continue reading on loud voice and you keep on catching him don't let him go and read read until he dies or maybe he has run away but anyway he will not come back the third case is when jinns appear to us so we cannot see jinns in their true in their true form as Allah Ta'ala says they see you he sees you, he and his people, from where you don't see them. But sometimes the jinns appear to us in a shape like human or like animal, like snake, like dog, like cat, or like uh, um, birds. So that happens in time of Prophet Sallallahu That happens from time to time. It is rare, but it can happen. So if you do see that, what should you do? If you see this strange thing, for example, in your house or your going in a weird place by night and you see something strange that should not be there so and you feel it could be jinn so what should you do so you must know that jinns cannot appear or disappear when you are looking at them you cannot look in an empty place and a jinn will pop up in front of you you have to turn around and look back and suddenly you see something you don't know how he came here and also once he is here he cannot leave if you're looking at him you have to look elsewhere and turn back and and he has disappeared. So if you see this weird thing that is frightening and that might be jinn, what should you do? You have to f look at him, focus at him, don't let him go. So when you look at him, he cannot go anywhere. You have caught him just with your eyes, just by looking at him. So you look at him, stare at him, and repeat Ayat al-Kursi until he's dead. If he's a bad jinn, he's gonna die. And if he is just a normal animal, just go away. And that will be the end of it. So it is very simple. No need to run away, jump through the window, make a car accident. Just stare at him and read Ayat al-Kursi until he's finished.
The fourth case is possession. People being possessed, falling down, screaming, moving, and Jin speaking, I'm going to kill him, uh, I want to marry her, I'm here to spoil her life, etc. So what should you do in that case? You have to catch the person, read Ayat al-Kursi on him, hit his neck gently like this with your hand, as if your hand was a sword and you're chopping his head off. Inshallah, after a few minutes, the Jin will feel his head being cut off and he's going and he's going to run away and the person will wake up so that time you'd say you tell the person now we're going to ask Allah to bring his back him back so we will finish with him and we're not going to let him play with us every time he will come every time he will go so you repeat أينما تكون ياتبكم الله جميعا إن الله على كل شيء قدير until the jinn is back and when the jinn is back into the person, now the situation has reversed. Instead of the jinn possessing the person, it is the person possessing the jinn. Because we have made him come by the will of Allah and by the words of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And this time you will read Ayat al Kursi and hit his neck and he will not be able to run away like the first time. So we will go to continue until either he dies or until either he dies or he becomes Muslim and there will be no third solution and once we have done that we are going to ask Allah Ta'ala to bring the jinns remaining in the person and repeat until they come and they become Muslim Insha'Allah it will be easier for them to become Muslim because we have we have we have found in our experience that when jinn have become Muslim in one's body speaking through his mouth it will become easier for the next jinns to embrace Islam and next one next ones because they will find all these discussions that have convinced the previous jinns to become Muslim they will find it and understand it immediately or very fastly and it will be easier for them to become Muslim so once you finished with the patient then you say now go to ask Allah Ta'ala to bring the jinns in your house and in your family to make them become Muslim. Once you finish the, with that, you say we're going to ask Allah Ta'ala to bring the sorcerers, the, the jinns of the sorcerers who worked on you, who sent those jinns, we're going to bring the jinns remaining with them to make them all embrace Islam. So you repeat Ainamatakun until they all come and they become Muslim. So once you have finished that with the with the patient, so that is how we get to jinn catching. That means at that stage that person is capable inshallah of bringing any jinn in him and making him become Muslim so that is we call jinn catchers and we keep them in our groups if they are willing to work with us and to help other people by Rukhya and that help us that any patient who comes we can bring his jinns immediately and discuss with them make them become Muslim make them go so why should we do that and why not bring the jinns in the same patient and speak with them because most of the patients jinns will not speak through their mouth and it is very harassing very difficult to insist on a patient until to force the jinn to speak when he has not speaking previously and second point when we bring them into this jinn catcher it, they will be very vulnerable and totally exposed because all their sihr is left there they come alone and they do not choose to come and they speak they are on surface they are not hidden inside that person and they are much more vulnerable to Quran or if you hit them this way if we hit them that will chop their bodies from piece after piece and that will incite them to become Muslim and the Quran will have more direct effect on them and also through that catcher because many jinns have converted previously it will be easier for them to become Muslim so this is the reason why we use these catchers so it help us to treat people much easier and faster and um, and so the conclusion that the jinn catching is using their own weapon against them as in all these cases of beating the jinns it is because they have come to us in our dreams or paralyzing someone sleeping or appearing in front of you because they have come into our world that gave us power to catch them and to kill them and to fight them because they have come to our world you see and it is the same for jinn catching because jinns have possessed some people so that made us reach the point to return their work against them and to be able to possess them too, to catch them too, by the will 
of Allah by using the Dua and Quran. And the last, uh, I also want to say that the jinn catching method is not an absolute and perfect method. No, it is a step forward, but it has limits. It has limits. Sometimes someone has a jinn and we're not able to catch him because maybe he's too strong or he's too much stuck in his brains or he's attached by sorcery or sometimes people have loads and loads of jinn so we catch, catch, catch and it's not coming to an end and there's one jinn always speaking and he can be making fun of us saying no you did not do anything I did not feel anything and we keep on removing more and more jinns but it's not coming to an end also when we, once we have removed jinns from a person it is possible that other jinns come inside him it is possible that you have missed some jinns that were inside him and they were hidden so that we did not reach them anyway I'm just saying that it's not you, you must you, you must not see this method as being perfect or total or complete but it is it does help so I was saying there are five ways to beat the jinns when they come in your dreams when you're paralyzed when you're sleeping when you see them in reality when they possess a person and the fifth method is the mental method I'm going to give you an example for example someone having a lot of sexual dreams and you understand that this is due to jinns so before sleeping you're going to speak to them or to, to him or to her and tell her I know that you are coming in my dreams that this is not a natural thing so come here I want to speak to you you that come every time in my dreams and then you start so when you speak this way to the jinns that will attract them and oblige them to listen to you and then you read وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Amongst his signs he has created for you from your own selves, spouses or husbands to find Sakina, to find peace with them and he put amongst you love and mercy. There are signs to, for the people who think. It is Surat Ar-Rum, uh, Surat Ar-Rum, the verse 21. So you repeat this verse about 30 times and this verse will show the jinn that marriage has to be from the same space otherwise it is not leading anywhere so that will inshallah show them that Allah has created for them good husbands and wives from jinns and they will find peace and happiness and love and mercy with them inshallah they will leave, leave you to go with their own kind of husbands and wives so once you have read this verse as so many times then you say if now if I see you again in my dream inshallah I will kill you and you go to sleep with that determination inshallah it will be finished with him so this is the mental method so if you have any problem with the jinn you can concentrate take a time to speak to him and look for a specific verse to reply to his problem to solve his problem and repeat that ver verse about 30 times or more Inshallah that will convince him and that will stop the problem. So now I'm going to tell you about psychotherapy. What is psychotherapy is treating the mental problems that are due to that are due to effects of sufferings in the life. So when someone suffers from something that will leave an effect on his mind and for example if a dog bites you you'll be afraid of dogs if you have an accident you'll be afraid of uh, speed or afraid of heights if uh, a child has been uh, has had a very difficult uh, education so that will confuse his personality he can become very shy unable to speak in front of people etc so whatever pains you have suffered that will affect you that will affect your behavior and your feelings and what is the relation between this and jinns and sorcery is that more someone has been affected and more that weakens the, his personality so the more that gives space and power to jinns and sihr to dominate him so some patients ha have uh, serious mental problems 
that means they have suffered too much and that is affecting their personality and that is not allowing the patient to cure from sorcery and gin so we need to make this psychotherapy to him to treat him on both sides and some patients have a major psychological issue and maybe not any sihr or jinn issue at all and we must understand also psychological problems in order to make the difference between what is coming from jinns and sorcery and what is not what is coming from uh, bad experiences the person has had in his life so the way we do psychotherapy is get the patient to close his eyes and to look at the situation that brought, made him suffer in his life and repeat the thing that expresses that suffering for example I, I'm falling down the car hits me my dad's dead whatever the thing is that's happening to him is going to repeat it repeat it until all the suffering has gone out and he feels good about it and then we go on to the next thing to the next thing until it is all out so when uh, someone has genes that possess him those genes will will not bear that psychotherapy because that is reducing their space as if the walls are closing on you and those genes will will do uh, what they can to disturb the psychotherapy and stop the person following and repeating that so at that time we would send the person so do your best not to take not to take account of them and continue concentrating on repeating the same thing on repeating what uh, pain you have gone through so once I was doing this with the patient and suddenly the jinn spoke the jinn spoke out of him and said what are you doing so I said what am I doing I, I know what I am doing but I want him to say I want to understand his point of view how what is he uh, what is what is happening on his side so he said you are you are you are erasing his souvenirs subhanallah and he said it in such a way and that means it is his painful souvenirs because the psychotherapy there is no nothing being erased as such from the memory that means you remember everything in your conscious there's no hypnosis You're just thinking of what has pained you and repeated to remove the bad feelings it is actually removing the pain from the souvenir and so that souvenir will not be for the jinns of any use you see this is why the jinn says you are removing his souvenirs that means those souvenirs the jinn needs to have a grip on his mind it is the souvenirs containing pains and another time I was doing psychotherapy with a patient and she was repeating whatever thing was paining her and I was explaining to someone well this is psychotherapy this is how it works and we had a gene catcher with us and the gene of that patient was speaking through the gene catcher and when she was repeating something like I fell down or he hit me he hit me he hit me and the gin through the gin catcher was saying ah like he was being torn like if his body was being cut uh, and I was explaining to the person now this psychotherapy is removing the pains from the person's mind and the jinns cannot bear it because it is reducing their space and and tearing their bodies and what is happening in this patient's mind is shown on the gene catcher like a, is projected on the gene catcher so what is happening inside the mind is projected on this person and you can see how the genes in what is how the genes in her mind are acting what is happening to them mashallah this was a fantastic experience and that experience shows the triple truth what is the triple truth since I was young alhamdulillah I was interested in all kinds of sciences and there are three sciences in human knowledge that humans as a general could not could not cut short uh, they cannot get to a clue even if some have a clue but as you globally I mean like mathematics or physics or medicine or um, all these sciences they are clear for humans uh, they are clear even if there are some small details that can 
that are not clear. But these three sciences that are not clear for humans, first is philosophy and religion. Alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we have the conviction, the conviction about Islam and we have proofs of of Allah Taala existing and of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being Prophet and Quran being words of Allah. But when you take globally for humans, this is a field that men men generally could not could not cut short, could not end this discussion, this debate about God and religion and philosophy. And the second field is the mental, the mental, human mental, how to explain depression, how to explain schizophrenia, how to explain this and that, uh, how to explain different moods. So this also is something maybe some people have understood and got to a solution and got to rationalize and to understand, make it clear, but most of humans don't have it clear. And the third uh, field is genes, genes and sorcery and evil life, possession and uh, what some people think are uh, living after death, that we say it is related to genes experience. So this other th third field also, it is difficult to have something logical and scientific about it. So this combination of psychotherapy and genes and Rokia and gene catching shows these three realities. The reality of Quran, the effect of Quran on genes and the effect of Quran on patients, the reality of genes that speak, that convert, that tell about their world and the reality of the mental functioning of human and how the genes act in his mental and how the Quran act on those genes. So these three truths, the truth of Deen through Quran and the truth of genes and the truth of mental appear in this combination of psychotherapy and Ruqya and gene catching. Now I'm going to tell you about the protections. So the protections we are going to tell you are the basic protection, protections that are taught in Sunnah. Reading Ikhlas Falaq and Nas three times after Subh, after Maghrib and before sleeping. Reading Ayat Al-Kursi after each prayer and before sleeping. Reading A'udhu bi kalimati Allah tamati min sharri ma khalaq bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma asmihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil samai wa huwa samiul alim. Three times before after Subh and three times after Maghrib saying Bismillah at five moments when entering your house, before eating, before taking your clothes off, before going to the toilet and before relation with your, you with your uh, before relations in the couple. And you must not leave in your house uh, in these five moments where you should say Bismillah, the dua of Prophet وسلم, that are important uh, to learn and to recite, to read at all these moments. If you don't know them, at least say Bismillah. And all those who live in your heart, in your house, teach them to say Bismillah at these moments. Also, you must not leave a picture or a statue of a living being exposed in your house because that makes shayateen and jinns coming into your house and angels to run away from your house. Also, you must remember Allah Taala in three moments, in moments of anger and moments of fear and moments of sadness because they are moments of weakness of man where jinns can overcome man. So, in the, in the anger, you must say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. In sadness, you say, Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilayhi Rajeeun. And in fear, you say, Allahumma Inna Naj'aluka Fi Nuhurihim wa Na'udhu Bika Min Shururihim. Also, you must say, Bismillah, when you cross water, especially dirty water, or you throw something in water, especially hot boiling water, if you have prepared rice or tea, and you throw away the hot water, always say, Bismillah, before pouring it. And the first and most important of all protections is leaving the sins, leaving the sins in the first place, because if you do sins, that will break, remove all the protections. For example, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, if you go out of your house, you say, Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwta illa billah. The angels will protect you and shaitan will go away from you. But if you go out of your house and you start looking at women, so the angels will leave you 
and your shaitan will be back to you. And if it is a woman not properly veiled as Islam asks, as Islam requires, and she goes out making the dua, yet the angels will leave her and shaitan will come to her. This is why the first and most important protection is leaving the sins. And after that, all these dua and verses of Quran you will read and prayers that will make you a spiritual protection. And you must know that there is nothing that you can keep with you, attach with you, wear or hang in your house, in whatever, that will protect you. It is only your deeds, your good actions, your prayer, your dhikr, your dua, that will help you. As Rasulullah said, Ihfadillah yahfadka, Ihfadillah tajidu tujah, keep Allah, keep the deen of Allah. Allah will keep you, keep the deen of Allah, you will find Allah with you. Now we're going to talk about shirk. Besides sorcery and fortune tellers and uh, future tellers that are clearly shirk and kufr, there are four types of shirk that exist that are widespread within Muslims. So the first is sacrifices for jinns, like slaughtering sheep, black sheep, black chicken, pouring walk, pouring water, pouring milk, giving food to jinns, lighting candles, uh, uh, spilling wine, uh, giving money, etc. Whatever gifts are given to jinns, it is all shirk. And Rasulullah said, cure your ill people with sadaqa, uh, with alms, by giving sadaqa. With this sadaqa does not have to be slaughtering an animal and making blood, uh, spilling blood. And even if you want to give a sheep or an animal to uh, poor people and asking Allah Ta'ala to cure your son, your father, whatever, there's no reason to look for a black uh, sheep or a black chicken. Those conditions are given by jinns because that makes a difference in their world. And when you do that condition for jinns, it is a sacrifice you have given to jinns. Even if you say Bismillah, it will go to the jinns. So this is something you must never do. And the second Shirk is using names of jinns in writings or dua or dhikr, uh, like Badduh, Qatmir, Israfayayil, Jaljalud, other different kinds of names. And even if some people say it is names of Allah in different languages or whatever, you in dua you're not allowed to use these things. You only can ask Allah Ta'ala, don't ask Badduh, don't ask this and that different things you don't know who you are asking who you are worshiping so if you find any dua uh, that you don't understand if it is from Quran and hadith you can say it even if you don't understand but it is better that you learn to understand it but if it is not from Quran and hadith and it has weird words and weird ways of saying things so leave it absolutely leave it and especially if that dua is said to be very powerful and to do this and that that is not normal. What is more powerful than, than Fatiha? What is more powerful than Ayat al-Kursi? What is more powerful uh, than Surat Ikhlas? Uh, so that you will use that and leave. No, there is no. If you want your du'as to be accepted, you must look for Taqwa. As Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah accepts from pious people and there is no shortcuts to leave the taqwa and to find a special dua and a special procedure to get your dua accepted. So be very, very, very careful is if there are things that are not understandable and that do not come from sunnah in this dua. So leave it definitely. And the third kind of uh, shirk is rings and bracelets for luck and for protection. If they tell you that this ring will protect you or give you luck, uh, so be sure that it is made with shirk. And the last kind of shirk that is widespread between Muslims is talismans, tama'im, kitab, hiris, ta'wiz, hijab, grigri, juju, uh, those things that you hang on yourself or in your house, in your office, in your business, on your car for having fortune and for protection. Rasulullah said in so many hadith that tama'im, uh, tama'im, all these things that are used for protection are, are shirk. Yet, 
yet we are going to discuss uh, about that. If one person is not convinced about the shirk he is doing and we tell him leave that ring, leave this thing that's not good, he says no, it is a big uh, sheikh, it is a alim, a scholar, a maulana, it is, uh, it is a pious person that have given me this, or it is my mother that told me to keep me this. So by jinn catching we can bring the jinns related to that thing immediately if there are any jinns related to it and ask them what is this, how was it done, what, how is it functioning, uh, what is your relation with Iblis and they will say inshallah everything related to that and we will put that on internet so everybody can understand what these things are about. And when someone does the Ruqya treatment he should repent from his sins because Allah Ta'ala says وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Whatever uh, problem happens to you, it is because of what you have done. So look for your sins to repent and uh, um, uh, arrange your relation with Allah Ta'ala. Make more prayers, read more Quran so that Allah will help you getting cured. But if a person does shirk, that will always bring jinns to him and it will not be possible for him to cure. So this is why we uh, have to ask people to leave all these kinds of shirk and even if there is a doubt that this could be shirk, we need to tell the person to leave it. Otherwise, otherwise we might not be able to, I mean, to cure him and to relieve the problems he has. So I'm going to test I'm going to go in more details about talismans, about talismans, about tamaim, these things that people wear and keep with them. So we take them from our patients, we remove them, we open them, we see what's inside. So they contain mostly Quran and Dua and also some word names and some symbols and grids with numbers and letters. And these grids and the symbols and the names, they are calling jinns, they are codes to bring jinns and ask them to help the person, ask them to protect him, to remove this pain from him, to do this and that for him and what happens, these jinns are here and maybe they will help the person, maybe they will not help him but they will harm him more than that. So that is exactly what Allah Ta'ala says about وَإِنَّهُ وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهِقًا There were some men asking protection from jinns and they harmed them more. This is exactly what Tamayim are about. Now some Hanafi and Shafi'i scholars, ulama, allow talisman that only contains Quran and Dua but a high majority of these talismans we take out of people, uh, they contain un-understandable elements or obvious shirk, things that are not understandable or things that are clearly shirk. Uh, most of them do have that. And why do they have that? Because I want to tell you something, my conviction is that if you have a talisman that only contains Qur'an and Dua, it will not have any effect on the person. I'm going to explain this to you, insha'Allah. For example, Rasulullah said that if you read Ayat al-Kursi before sleeping, Allah will protect you and not one shaitan can come to you. Now, if you write Ayat al-Kursi on a frame and you put it on top of your bed, will that protect you? Will that stop shaitan from coming to you? No, it will not. It will not. You have to read it yourself. If you have a Quran in your room, this Quran is closed, does, have, does that have an effect on your room? If you open that Quran and you leave it open all the time, on any page, will that Quran have an effect on your room? It does not have an effect because it is not a good action. It is not, you don't get hasanat. You don't get good action for that. The angel will not try it. For example, that if you have a Quran book in your room 
every day you keep that Quran in your room, you'll get one tree in paradise or one palace in paradise that does not exist. You don't have any reward for just keeping the Quran in your room or even if it is open for having it open in your room. There's no reward. Angels not right. Oh, this guy, he's got five Mus'haf in his house. He must get every day so much and so much of Hasanat. Only if you read that Mus'haf or you listen to Quran or you recite it in your prayers or you learn it by heart, for all that you have reward, but not for just keeping a book of Quran or having it open. So, one action that will not give you any Hasanat any good action that will not get you closer to Allah that will not give you any reward on day of judgment that angels will not write as being a good action be sure that that action will not give you any barakah in your life because it is not a good action at all it is not a good action at all and uh, the shifa of Quran the rahmah of Quran comes when we you read that Quran we use it we use that Quran for Shifa. But just having a Quran in your house or having it open will not do anything. So what frame can you put that will stop jinns coming into your house, that will bring barakat in your house just before you have put it? Even if it is whole Quran, it will not have that effect in your house. So, so this is why they add inside and same thing if you have it with you. So if I go make Dhuhr prayer in the mosque, I make wudu at home, I go to pray in the mosque. If I take a mushaf with me, a Quran book with me, put it in my pocket, go with it, pray with it, come back with it, will that increase my degrees of jama'a namaz or jama'a prayer? Will that increase my reward for going to the mosque? Is those Are those steps I'm making with ablution in my house and going to the mosque, will they count double? Or will that count better? Because I have a Quran in my pocket, it will count for nothing. So, having carrying a Quran and going around with a Quran will not give me more hasanat. So, having this piece of paper with Quran inside will not give me any hasanat and will not have effect on me. This is my conviction, and this is why we believe that these things cannot cure the person, cannot cure the person or protect the person and this is why most of the time these tamaim, these talismans contains the other things, contain these symbols and these grids with numbers because if they only have Quran and Dua that will have no effect on the person. So to produce some effect you, they have to do something that will bring jinns and those jinns will maybe give some benefit to the person but they will surely harm him. I'm going to give you an example of one patient I had and he told me that he went abroad to another country to see one person who gave him who gave him a talisman that he attached on his neck because he couldn't sleep and since he has done that he sleeps better but then another problem happened that he lost his uh, he, he lost he became he lost his sexual power with his wife and so we got the jinns that were with that talisman he had and I asked them well did you solve his sleeping problem they said no never so I said well what did you do they said we made an arrangement with the ones who were already there that means there were jinns there to stop him sleeping and we made an arrangement with them to let him sleep and we will take his sexual power instead so that is, is that is that it that is what it is always about. Jinns coming, trying to help you. Maybe they will, maybe they will not, but surely they will harm you more. So they are only changing the problem. It is like if you take money from your right pocket and you put it in your left pocket and you have to pay for doing this operation. So there's no way you can get anything better in your life. And what you are winning here you are losing more on the other side. That is how it works. So we made them become Muslim and I told them that now you can go. They said, but we have to be paid for the work we have done. We have done this work of changing his sleeping problem into a sexual problem. That is a job we have done and we have to be paid for this job. And 
the uh, the person who sent us uh, who sent us to do this work he has given us he has promised us one person of his family for having done this job and we have chosen his daughter so we need to take his daughter for the job we have done letting him sleep allowing him to sleep and taking off his sexual power so you see what this man has done he has traveled abroad spent a lot of money go to someone giving him giving him a tamima uh, a talisman that is shirk and he got some sleep so that is the positive thing thing inside but he lost his sexual power with his wife and he has sacrificed his daughter not knowing it and he has fallen into shirk lost his faith lost his iman so you see so this is why really we recommend everybody to leave these talismans totally so this is why we believe that these talismans do not have if it if they only contain quran and dua that will not have effect you must read quran you must read dua to get their benefit and this is why there most of the time you get these other things added inside so i want to say that Indian talismans, African, Arab, Comorian, Turkish, whatever, they are all the same. They are all the same and they are made from the same books. And so the jinn catching enables to bring the jinns of talismans and ask them what is this about, what are these grids about, what are these names about, what are all this about. And uh, maybe you have seen, uh, we put them on internet and you have seen this jinn baddu and this jinn such and such and such gene. Now in our group we have five objectives. We are a group because we have reached over 60 centers in 26 countries. So it is hundreds, alhamdulillah, and hundreds of people I have trained and they are practicing this method of Rokya. So we have become a group and we have five objectives in our group. The first is to relieve people that are suffering and stuck in their lives. And second purpose is to save the faith, the Iman of Muslims from shirk. The third purpose it is a means of da'wah for non-Muslims. And the Sahaba عنهم, in two different stories, they have treated non-Muslims with Quran, with Fatiha, and they have been cured by the grace of Allah and Prophet has approved their work. And the fourth objective is to, is to fight sorcery and shirk. To fight them as we have said that for each patient who comes we can get the genes that are with him and also the genes of the sorcerer who sent them and after we finish converting them we'll read on them and fight the allies of the devil and when we read this verse so the genes understand that the allies of the devil are the sorcerers and the people asking them to do so, to do the sorcery, and they'll go to fight them by the will, by the order of Allah Taala. So every time we'll remove the jinns of the sorcerers and send them back to fight them. So this is how we have this objective of fighting the shirk and sorcery and finishing it. Also, the jinn catching enables us to visit places of shirk and places of sorcerers and to catch their jinns and to break their shirk and to let those jinns fight those sorcerers mashallah and the last objective is to break the ruqya's business that means in some places some people do ruqya islamic ruqya but they charge a lot of money and they hide the method they hide the methods and they don't teach it so they will keep that for themselves so we break that business by teaching it to all people who are interested in learning and alhamdulillah, this is how we have reached over 60 centers in 26 countries. Now, the campaigns, the Rokia campaigns we organize, alhamdulillah, I spend most of the year in Rokia campaigns to treat people, to train people, to alert people about Rokia topic and to establish Rokia centers. Some of my pupils, some of my students also uh, lead and organize campaigns themselves alhamdulillah so if you want to receive a campaign that requires first of all people who want to learn Rokia and secondly it requires a place where we can receive people and for treatment for training and where the Rokia team will stay 
And third point, it requires a means of contacting the community, like speaking in mosques or through any kind of media. And then, once you have all that, we, we can arrange and wait to get, uh, to get uh, a date, inshallah, to come. All the fees of the campaigns are financed are paid by the treatment of the patients so alhamdulillah we don't need any alhamdulillah we don't need any uh, person to help us or to give us money for this work we will need people to learn to do it and to practice it everywhere inshallah and my role in the campaign my role in the campaign is mostly the communication speaking in mosques in medias visiting the important people and uh, my team, my crew do the most of the training and the treatment of the patients, even the consultation. So the purpose of this is not to have a movement around my person. The purpose is to make a solution and offer, bring the solution to Muslims. So it will be, everybody can do it. Many people can do it and can be cured by the grace of Allah Tabarakwa Ta'ala. Not traveling far away to come to meet me or waiting for me myself to come to treat people no we need the people who want to learn and they will practice it we will keep in touch inshallah to follow up with them and so they will practice it and inshallah people will be relieved everywhere and participating in a campaign is the best way inshallah is the best way to train and to learn uh, how to do Rukhya. so there are three stages in the Rukhya. That means when we start in a country, we have three stages. The first stage is to establish a permanent center. And that requires to train a, a, a maximum number of people. Because when we train a lot of people, some will be busy, some will have different situations, and just a few will be left to continue the Rukhya to the public. And we, it also requires a campaign as large as possible uh, so that that will create a movement of people being cured and uh, people hearing about about it so it will continue after we leave and the third uh, point is to visit the religious authorities so wherever we go we try to contact the ulama the scholars and the responsibles of uh, islamic activities so that we will cooperate with them uh, for this work and get their understanding and get their nasiha, get their advice and even if they have some uh, disagreement with us we'll try to clarify it, uh, to remove it or at least to reduce it inshallah. And the last point is to visit local authorities to organize ourselves according to the local laws and to local regulations as much as we can. This is quite very different from country to country, from continent to continent. And once we have established a permanent center and the center is going on and the center is stable and the center has enough people uh, to practice Ruqya, is getting enough patients, so the second stage is expansion. And there are four points in the expansion of the Rukhya. First is the geographic expansion, that means opening centers in other cities in the country, maybe even in other neighborhoods in the main city. And second, expansion in medias, that means using all different kinds of medias to express, to talk about ourselves, to contact the people. And because so many people are ill, are having problems and not knowing where to go so we must show them that there is a solution to their problems and the third point is collaboration with the health corps with the uh, medicine uh, organization with health authorities uh, so with doctors with the all health authorities because we have so many people that are ill and that I have spent a lot of time a lot of money in medic in medicine without funding any solution so when we uh, treat them alhamdulillah they get cured so we want to alert the authorities that such and such problems ha have mystic reasons are related to jinn and sorcery and we can treat them inshallah so they will hand those patients over we also want to get recognized 
as a medical organization uh, that has happened alhamdulillah in one country so far in guinea conakry uh, where the ruqya is recognized as a medical organization and working with the ministry of health and minist different ministries according to the needs and the fourth point in the expansion is training the religious corps that means imams and ustas and ulama and whatever uh, getting them involved in Ruqya by first of all understanding the subject so that the Ibams and other religious leaders will know, will understand when the people come and tell them about their problems and will know how to orientate them. Uh, the second uh, point is what some basic treatments they can give without taking risks with jinns and sorcerers. So there are some basic and very useful treatments that uh, Imam or Ustaz or Alim can do to help someone without getting involved himself and without getting risks with jinns and that is very useful. And the third point, the third stage of Ruqya, once we have a permanent center and once we have made expansion and have, have got many centers and have got uh, into medias etc. So the third uh, stages eradication, the eradication of sorcery by fighting all the sorcerers and the eradication of shirk in all its shapes because wherever there is shirk there are jinns and shayateen inside so when we remove those jinns and shayateen that will weaken that shirk inshallah and in the training of Ruqya there are three levels of training first level of training is the practice of Ruqya so that contains six courses, the risks and protections. So that is the first thing we'll teach you when you come into Ruqya, what are the risks you are encountering and how to protect yourself, how to avoid those dangers. The second uh, course is cupping, hijama. The third is the recitation of Ruqya. Then the treatment, how to explain the treatment to the patient. The fifth is the simple symbols in sorcery. And the sixth uh, course is diagnostic. So once you have once you have done those courses, when you, once you have gone through the theoretical and practical courses, so you can practice Ruqya, you can receive people and follow them from A to Z to treat them, inshallah. And the second level of training is professionalization. And that includes gene catching, psychotherapy, spiritual program, relation with medicine, deleels, that means the arguments of jinn, of uh, the arguments of Quran and Hadith, to show that what we are doing is Islamic and also knowing the other methods in Ruqya. Now the third level of training is managing a Ruqya center and that includes these, uh, these courses, the five stages of the group, preaching the Ruqya, the three stages of Ruqya, the Imam's training, then dealing with money, handling the money in the Ruqya centers and tightening the ranks uh, of the group. Now I'm going to discuss a bit about the gene catching. Some people see it as a new strange thing. It is strange, it is new, even if some people before us did it. But some people say it is bid'ah, it is shirk, or it uh, did not do that, so we should not do it. And that is shirk, it is using jinns. So this is something we must clarify. So first of all, I want to say that the catching is only one peace in our work. Our work is not all around catching. Even if that is a part that is very spectacular, how jinns come, how we speak with jinns, how they embrace Islam, but as you have seen, there is much, much more uh, in our work and in the evolution of Ruqya. Secondly, the catching started by the dua of a possessive brother. How it all started? The first group I trained in Burkina Faso, when I left them, the sorcerers made sihr on them like rain, on themselves, on their families, on their patients, so that even if a patient come for one or two problems, he will be better for two or three days, then he will get ten problems. So the sorcerers were specially attacking their patients so, so that they will not get cured and so that no one will come to them. So the brothers found themselves spending all their time uh, treating one another. And one of these brothers had already 
jinns possessing him and he was fighting his own jinns and he was reading reading Quran and when he reached to dominate that jinn the jinn ran away so the brothers got sad how I have done all this effort now the jinn is going to go back to the sorcerers get new sacrifices get more strength come back on me so I'm not getting out of this at all so he said Ya Allah bring him back to me so I can finish him off and in the same time in the same moment the jinn came back into him and he managed to finish him off so when he then did that then he realized that if any patient come he could just say Ya Allah bring me his jinn so I can control him so I will um, so I will catch him and immediately the jinn will come into him and the jinn will speak immediately say what am I doing here I was with this patient how come I came here and we say that we asked Allah Ta'ala to bring you and Allah has brought you yeah? and that puts the jinn in such a vulnerable situation that if we cut him if we hit the brother this way that will cut his body and if you cut his head so he will die and if you read Quran that will affect him immediately and so that makes them embrace Islam much easier so this is how it, it all started and when we saw that the first time we thought it was something special Allah has given him because he has suffered so much and he has made so much efforts that Allah gave him that but then we quickly realized that any person that was possessed could do that but some people when they are possessed and we try to use them for gene catching after we have removed their genes so that brings them back into being ill into being tired exhausted and they cannot do it so we will just treat them and and uh, let them go home and not use them as catchers as it is harming them and we will only keep those who can do it without any problem so in jinn catching there's nothing else than dua and reading quran there's nothing else what you see is totally transparent it's totally uh, there's nothing hidden and i prove that there's nothing hidden because in all our centers we treat people we train people and we we show we we get new jinn catchers and we show people how to how to do the catching and they do it and there's nothing hidden there is nothing hidden. Uh, all this work we are doing is for the sake of Islam. Even if you are gaining money and, and earning money with it. But I can tell you myself out of these 60 centers throughout the world. I don't take any money out of that. Only if I am here and I am working I get a part of what we work. But all these people once they are trained they are free to work. And we help them as we can and the money is for them. So there is no other purpose in that but to help Islam. So there is nothing hidden. What you see it is that. It is only using Dua and Quran. There is nothing else hidden behind it. Amongst the ulama who accepted this method and authorized it, there is Abu Bakr Fofana from Ivory Coast, Amin Din from Kano in Nigeria, uh, Anas Ahmed Lala in Reunion Island, Sheikh Abdul Qayyum, Mufti Abdul Qayyum from London, Hoja Suleiman in Germany, Sheikh Munir Kawankar in Tunisia, and the uh, Saudi Arabia General Mufti and his assistant Ahmed Al Mubaraki. Actually, the best answer I had, I appreciated uh, the scientific answer, was that of the Mufti of Saudi Arabia. When I explained to him, I gave him the paper, I explained, he said that what is using dua and quran is not haram there is nothing forbidden with that because the ruqya is an open field so if you do something with dua and quran there is nothing that that is haram with that second point you say that the jinn of the patient came to this man and he became muslim and he went away we cannot say it is true we cannot say it is wrong because we don't have anything we don't have a way to attest that it is truly the jinn of that person that came into this person and now he has become muslim and now he has god so are you sure about that i said yes i am sure because of experience because of quran because of uh, people getting uh, cured because of this experience has been repeated hundreds of times on tens of catchers so I am sure this is how it works. They said, but we cannot be sure. We cannot say anything. And this is why we cannot write you a paper that what you are doing is good and you can carry on 
all we can say is that using dua and Quran is not is not forbidden by religion. What you say, as you describe it, is not forbidden. But is it true? Is it working? We cannot say anything. So, Alhamdulillah, I found it a really scientific and uh, logical approach and clearly a shari approach with the leads. Uh, so, someone can not agree, cannot believe, can say, no, this is, seems dodgy to me, I don't believe it. But you cannot say that we are doing something haram or something shirk. Now, Ruqya is an evolutive field like medicine. That means it is ishtihadi. That means one can make experiment, can make new methods as long as there is no shirk. And there are many, many delils for this, many, many delils. But all the delils in Sunnah go in the show that the Ruqya is not something that is limited to what Rasulullah has taught. All the delils. I will recommend you one book. I don't even know if it, this book is translated in English. It is um, Ruqya on the light of the Aqidah of the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah from Abdullah ibn Nufayr, it is a Saudi doctor. It is not a book of Ruqya giving methods to treat oneself. It is a book of analyzing the Ruqya through uh, Sharia. Uh, through Sharia look uh, and this shows very very clearly that Rokia is an open field like medicine so whatever new method you can do as long as, as there is no contradiction with Islam there is no shirk you can do any method you want and uh, the next point the hadith of the specificity of Sulaiman of the kingdom of Sulaiman shows that catching jinn is possible. This hadith Rasulullah said one morning that yesterday evening a shaitan I was praying and the shaitan came to disturb my prayer and I held, held him, I strangled him until I felt the cool of his um, saliva on my hand. And I wanted to attach him so that you will see him in the morning and the children of Medina will play with him. But I remember the dua of Suleiman so I let him go. Uh, so some people say yes, so it is impossible to control genes after Suleiman So this way of using this hadith is totally wrong because Rasulullah caught the jinn. He caught the jinn and he wanted to attach him. So it is possible to catch him, it is possible to attach him, it is possible to make a show of him. This is what Rasulullah wanted to do, but he remembered uh, the dua of Sulaiman that says, Rabbi li wa hab li mulka la yanbaghi li ahad min ba'di. Oh my Lord, forgive me and give me a kingdom that no one will ever have after me. And Rasulullah as a respect to the dua of Sulaiman let the jinn go. But that does not mean it was not possible and that does not mean it was not halal for Rasulullah to do it. And the proof also is that Hadrat Abu Huraira did the same thing. There's a jinn who came to, to steal, to rob the Sadaqah and he caught him and said, I'm going to take you to Rasulullah and he said, please leave me until he left him. So when he caught him, so that jinn now was his prisoner and Rasulullah was asking him, what did you do with your prisoner yesterday? He was his prisoner and it was possible for him to take him to Rasulullah and everybody will see him. And so it is possible to catch jinns after Sulaiman and it is not haram to do it. So what is special about the dua of Sulaiman Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَزِغْ مِنْهُمْ عَنْ أَمْرِنَا نُدِقْهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ Whoever Whoever jinn or shaitan will disobey to Sulaiman will hit him by hellfire. So this is the power Allah has given to Sulaiman If he tells a jinn, stay there or do this job, whatever he will tell him to do, that jinn has to obey it absolutely. Otherwise hellfire will hit him and he will die. So this is the power Allah has given to Sulaiman We don't have any kind of power ourselves. It is just asking Allah and reading Quran to bring those jinns and the jinns come. Now, 
also some people are surprised how does this dua work I mean it is, it is not it is very strange that someone will have dua that will just say Ya Allah I want this immediately this will come and immediately this will happen constantly like this in life this is very strange uh, so what we say what we say that the way dua works on jinns is the same way that Quran has effect on jinns we know that the Quran burns the jinns when they are not Muslim whereas the Quran does not burn the humans that are not Muslim uh, and we have seen the effect of Quran on jinns through various ways the effect of Quran on jinns for example when we recite فَقَاتِلُ أَوْلِيَا shaitan find the allies of the devil and they will see that the allies of the devil are the sorcerers and the people and the people going to sorcerers to ask them for sorcery and when you read the verse of couples on jinns they will understand that the jinn cannot be married with a human being and Allah has made for him jinniyat or jinns to get married with and to be happy with so the Quran has a direct effect on jinns that it does not have on human beings and it is on the same way that the dua affects jinns uh, and this is something that we saw ourselves and we were surprised and then we tried to understand why it is working that way so if someone does not believe that we bring jinns only with Quran and dua and accuse us of using shirk this is very this is very a serious matter accusing us of doing shirk just because they are surprised too much and they cannot believe that this is only using Quran and dua so this is lie and calumny uh, this is bad, very bad thing to say especially in Islamic field so please be very careful if you are accusing us of such things, may Allah Ta'ala forgive us and guide us. Now, the last thing I want to say is that for many people, the opposition to gene catching is a fixed idea in their mind. And whatever proofs, whatever thing we will give them, they still are not convinced. I'll give you two examples. One of my students, after some time, turned against me and came to tell me, no, gene catching is not good because of this and that. So I answered his arguments. And he said, well, I don't have any more argument to say any more, I don't have any more uh, delil uh, to say that this is haram, but I will look for a delil until I find it. I said, really, this is so much deceiving. This is so much deceiving. You don't have any delil to say it is haram, yet you are convinced it is haram, and you are going to look until you find the delil to say it is haram, this is not a proper way of thinking. If you don't have a delil, it is haram. So you must say it is not haram. Because I don't have any delil to say it is haram. And why should I look for a delil to say it is haram? I, why do I believe it is haram? When there is no delil that it is haram. Subhanallah. So it is just that when some people see jinn catching, they say, wow, this is fantastic. How Quran and jinns becoming Muslim and going away. And they say so many things about about how shirk is working and everything and they say this is great this is the power of Allah Alhamdulillah Allah has given us something to be the sorcerers uh, and to relieve people and some some other people say Astaghfirullah he is speaking with jinns what is this this is very strange uh, Rasulullah was not doing that with Sahaba and uh, the, this is like sorcerers they are the people discussing with jinns and uh, this person that the jinns come into his body he must be very sick uh, with that so it is just the feeling it is just the feeling they have and that gives them this conviction that this thing must not be good must not be good and that is why they have that feeling and another situation we were in a mosque and uh, and uh, there was an imam he was not a, a proper imam he was just leading the prayers prayers there was not a proper imam fixed there and uh, th that was graduated Imam he was just one of them leading the prayer and then so uh, we were in that Islamic center making Ruqya and after a couple of days he came and said actually he cannot keep us anymore because he does not agree with, with this method of gene catching and he said that 
there was one big alim that will come ne next day tomorrow and we must discuss with him and he also knows about Ruqya and if he accepts it, it will be okay. So that big alim came and we show, showed him jinn catching, we explained to him everything we do concerning hijama from A to Z and he said this is fine and he, I can see him smiling saying لا بأس بالرقاء ما لم يكن بها شرك so Rasulullah said there is no problem using Ruqi as long as there is no shirk inside, so it is okay. Yet that small Imam that was there, even that, that big alim said it is okay, he said no, I don't agree, you must leave this place. So we had to leave. Alhamdulillah, Ardullah wasi'a, the earth of Allah is large, so we have other places to go to. But this is how some people have just a fixed idea and keep thinking that this is shirk and this is wrong. May Allah Ta'ala guide us and forgive us and use us for the good of Islam and Muslims. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا